Hi, my name is Leo Cox. Welcome to my channel. Uh, this video is going to kind of do a throwback to a project which I did long before YouTube was in existence. And so we're going to try to uh, introduce it, the project to the YouTube audience uh, because the material is still very valid. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of historical information to the front end here. But the how and why each park became what they are. Um, when we're talking about Yosemite, we're talking a place that is just a storybook in granite, water, and trees. You can add whatever adjective you want to it because they will all fit the places. It's just a fabulous spot. The uh, early settlers to California knew about this, the, the valley and uh, envi environs, but uh, there was not much uh, visitation to it. You could uh, be very expensive to uh, get a, uh, a group together and uh, to get the way up. It was mostly by horseback, some, some wagons, but mostly horseback. Uh, but they knew about it, and uh, there, but there was not the visitation and the the thing that changed uh, changed the whole state. As a matter of fact, was in 1849, the California Gold Rush happened, and it, just exactly what it was. It was a rush not only to California but specifically to the Sierra, and uh, this is where this is where Yosemite lies in the High Sierra, uh, and it was. Uh, the number of people that came up there, uh, roads were improved, so again, now people could come uh, to visit. But uh, some of the stuff that happened up there in the Sierra, a lot of the entrepreneurs might have been taking a, uh, a clue from the old song, The uh, Big Yellow Taxi. You know, you pave paradise and put up a parking lot. And so it was getting kind of rough shot up there. In 1864, good old President Abraham Lincoln uh, signed the uh, Yosemite Grant, which transferred 1,200 square miles of land uh, from the federal government to the state of California with the directions to improve access and control, uh, control growth. Uh, it was the precursor of the national park system. Good old Abe took care of that. Uh, in 1890, uh, through the advocacy of John Muir and his uh, naturalist associates, uh, the actual Yosemite National Park was founded back in 1890. Uh, the park is timeless. Uh, you have El Capitan, you have Half Dome, uh, things that just you, you could tell that they are there forever. Um, the park doesn't change. The little changes would be forest fires, except for an exceptional forest fire the previous year, recent years. But we're not going to look at the uh, the recent years or the forest fires. We're going to take a look back to about 1990. We'll take a look at the, the crowds back then, and we'll see that we can still enjoy the park even with the number of people that were in the park at that time. So let's take a look. A rugged range of mountains stretches from north to south across the eastern half of the state of California. The granite peaks and forested valleys of these mountains are officially known as the Sierra Nevada. 
but threw out numerous references in movies, books, and magazines. These magnificent blocks of prehistoric rock are often referred to as simply the High Sierra. Within the heart of these mountains lies one of the most beautiful valleys in the world, Yosemite Valley, the focal point of the magnificence that is Yosemite National Park. The splendor of this valley is both its blessing and its plight, for it is this stunning setting, surrounded by towering walls of solid granite, that draws more than three million visitors per year into a valley that occupies just seven square miles out of a total park area of over 1,100 square miles. Congestion in the valley can mirror the congestion of urban centers like Los Angeles and San Francisco that are located just a few hours from the park. And yet, more than 94% of the park is designated as a wilderness area. The crush of visitors to the Central Valley has led to a number of changes in park operations. The institution of one-way roads and the designation of other former roadways as hiking and biking paths has helped to alleviate the congestion. More importantly, a system of shuttle buses now serves popular destinations both within the valley and to destinations beyond, such as the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias and the pastoral alpine setting of Tuolumne Meadows. There's another partial solution to the crowding problem. Individuals should plan to avoid the peak travel months of July and August whenever possible. The crisp, clean air of early autumn is a perfect time to see Yosemite. The park is still crowded, but the gridlock of the summer season is long past. The dazzling cliffs of El Capitan draw the eye upward to the brilliant blue California autumn sky. The vertical face of the unmistakable monolith known as Half Dome rises majestically above the surrounding valleys. There is a slower pace, a time to seek out the simpler sights. Autumn is a time to marvel at the quiet murmur of a pristine spring in the heart of the valley. The tranquil silence of a subalpine meadow covered with sepia-toned grasses waiting for winter's snows, and the arboreal splendor of giant sequoia trees rising hundreds of feet above the matted forest floor. Be aware of, and prepared for, rapidly changing weather conditions. As long as skies are clear and temperatures moderate, Autumn visitors to Yosemite can hike and bike to their heart's content, photograph whatever magnificent scenes their eyes behold, or climb the granite walls surrounding the valley to the limits of their courage and abilities. The 3,000-foot perpendicular face of El Capitan is a magnet for serious climbers from around the world. Begin your exploration of Yosemite Valley with a short hike to the base of Bridal Veil Falls. This half-mile round-trip hike has a vertical change of approximately 100 feet. The trail to this popular waterfall begins at the far end of the Bridal Veil parking lot, located near the western end of Yosemite Valley. A trail sign marks the departure of the narrow paved path from the broad service road that serves as the first portion of the trail. The trail is gradual enough that wheelchair travel is possible, though some assistance may be required. A quarter of a mile from the trailhead, visitors arrive at the base of this beautiful waterfall. The downside of an autumn visit to Yosemite is the fact that waterfalls are nowhere near their spring and midsummer splendor. Still, there is an ethereal beauty in this small stream, gently blown into a mist by rising air currents as it plunges 620 feet to the jumble of boulders at its base. At the opposite end of the valley, the trailhead for Mirror Lake is located at shuttle bus stop 17. The two-mile round trip to Mirror Lake follows a roadway that is now closed to automobiles. Today, the roadbed is reserved for hikers and bicyclists. This easy trail rises just 120 feet as it heads toward the distant face of Half Dome 
that frames the south wall of Tenaya Canyon. One half mile from the trailhead, hikers can leave the paved roadway for a rocky path that rises gently off to the left. One of the advantages of this path is the awe-inspiring view that hikers get from openings in the forested slope. Across the canyon, the vertical face of Half Dome towers above the scene below. Mirror Lake is a fraction of its previous size, and in early autumn it is no more than a wide pool in Tenaya Creek. The sandbar extending up the canyon beyond the reflected boulder is flooded during periods of snow melt and heavy rainfall. Now it is just a pleasant sandy beach in the middle of a green meadow. Unfortunately, Mirror Lake is barely a remnant of its former glory. But any scene at the foot of Half Dome has to be considered a breathtaking sight. Beyond the first look at what is left of Mirror Lake, a stone stairway leads to an additional three-mile round-trip hike called the Mirror Lake Loop. This trail passes through deep forests at the foot of Basket Dome, which rises above Tenaya Canyon opposite Half Dome. The initial portion of the path traces the former shoreline of the rapidly shrinking lake. Side trips off the trail take hikers down toward larger sandbars that now cover the canyon floor. The Mirror Lake Loop is not heavily traveled. It's a great place to get away from the more crowded areas of the main valley. It's also a place to meet an occasional group of riders on their way back to the stables. The trail leaves, then reapproaches the banks of Tenaya Creek. Here the creek is no more than a quiet pool surrounded by an even quieter forest. Around the bend it takes the form of a slow-moving brook, barely flowing down the nearly dry stream bed. The halfway point of the trail is marked by a bridge over the creek. The trickle of water passing under the bridge scarcely traces the course of the creek that still slowly grinds away at the granite boulders lining its banks. Beyond the bridge, the trail heads back toward the trailhead. Massive trunks of Douglas fir and mountain hemlock line the way. The trail returns to the open meadow portion of the trail near the trailhead. As the footpath leaves the shelter of the trees, the overshadowing presence of Half Dome totally dominates the scene. At the end of the loop portion of the trail, a second small footbridge returns hikers to the paved portion of the trail that leads back to the shuttle stop. In a land full of superlatives, Yosemite National Park shelters three separate groves of trees, magnificent specimens of massive evergreens with cinnamon-colored bark called the giant sequoia. The Mariposa Grove is located 36 miles south of Yosemite Valley near the south entrance to the park. A one and a half mile round trip hike through the Mariposa Grove takes hikers to the most frequently visited sequoia tree in the park, the grizzly giant. In addition to the featured sequoias, the forest is comprised of pine, hemlock, and fir. The smooth path move slowly upward past the broad trunks of hundreds of magnificent trees. Along the way, hikers pass the base of a fallen giant. Even lying on its side, the trunk of an ancient sequoia is a sight that invites closer inspection. A hiker pauses and leans back over the railing to compose her photograph. The sheer size of the four sequoias, known as the Bachelor and the Three Graces, makes it almost impossible to include the entirety of these magnificent trees in any single photograph. Three quarters of a mile from the trailhead, one of the largest living things on the face of the earth looms above the forest below. Staggering statistics describe this tree. The massive trunk contains over 30,000 cubic feet of lumber. The diameter at the base of the trunk is 29 feet. The first limb is located nearly 100 feet above the forest floor. The grizzly giant is more than 2,500 years old. In that time, who knows how many times it's been struck by lightning, 
Whether or not this tree ever reached the normal mature height for sequoias of 300 feet is unknown. Limbs, the size of mature trees, extend out from the massive trunk. Today, it leans 17 degrees off center, and its lightning truncated top stops just 209 feet above the ground. To experience yet another side of Yosemite splendors, take a 55-mile drive from Yosemite Valley to Tuolumne Meadows via the Tioga Road. Along the way, stop to walk along the shore of Siesta Lake, a small depression carved by ancient glaciers. The lake is now filling in with silt and marsh grasses that provide excellent feeding opportunities for passing waterfowl. Look back toward Yosemite Valley from the parking lot at Olmsted Point for a different view of Half Dome. Or, just before reaching Tuolumne Meadows, take the time to stop and enjoy a picnic lunch at any one of the numerous turnouts on the shores of Tenaya Lake, nestled in the granite splendor of the High Sierra. The Tuolumne River meanders through this peaceful valley. The valley was the starting point of many summer expeditions of the newly formed Sierra Club, led by its first president, John Muir, during the early 1900s. A one-mile round trip, level path to a soda spring, begins just across the road from the Tuolumne Meadows Visitor Center. The trail crosses the meadow near the foot of the smooth granite face of Lembert Dome. It is particularly important to confine hiking activity to the established trail in this meadow because of the fragile nature of the subalpine vegetation. The trail crosses the river via a bridge that was built by the Sierra Club in 1915. The rocks at the base of the bridge offer a pleasant place to just sit and enjoy the splendor of the scenery. Just beyond the bridge, a narrow footpath leads from the main trail to Parsons Lodge. The lodge is another structure completed by the Sierra Club in 1915. It was built to honor the work of Edward Parsons, a close associate of John Muir. A nearby cabin was built by early settlers in the valley in 1898. It was purchased by the Sierra Club in 1912 for their campground caretaker. The cabin remained in the club's hands until 1973 when it was then purchased by the National Park Service. It is now used as a ranger residence. Just downhill from Parsons Lodge, a signpost marks the way to the decaying ruins of the well house that once covered the Soda Spring. The first record of the spring dates to the year 1863. Soda Spring was the starting point of summer outings by John Muir and the Sierra Club starting in 1901. Today, Carbonated water still rises to the surface, bubbling from an underground reservoir, just as it did in those early days. Return to Yosemite Valley via the Tioga Road for a total change of pace from the short level path that marks Tuolumne Meadows. The shuttle bus stop at the Happy Isles Nature Center is the starting point for a strenuous hike to the top of two spectacular waterfalls, Vernal Falls and Nevada Falls. Total distance for this popular hike via a portion of the High Sierra Loop Trail is seven miles. The elevation change is 1,900 feet. Hikers should always have water and adequate clothing for changing weather conditions, especially on a hike of this duration. Early morning sun hasn't penetrated the shadows of the valley as hikers thread their way through large boulders that have fallen down the side of Grizzly Peak. The trail is a steady uphill climb that soon rises high above the Merced River as the river rushes through the valley below. Hikers pick their way up the trail as it crosses a rock fall containing thousands of boulders that have flaked off the hillside above. The scene almost looks like a part of some giant highway construction project. From the rock fall, hikers can look back across Illouette Gorge to the sheer white granite face of Illouette Ridge. Eight-tenths of a mile from the trailhead, after a climb of approximately 400 feet, the trail crosses a sturdy bridge over the Merced River. Beneath the bridge, the riverbed itself is a jumble of immense boulders. These huge rocks present a formidable obstacle course for this small stream 
as it works its way down to the placid valley below. From the bridge, hikers get their first look at Vernal Falls. From this distance, the falls appear to be a slender ribbon of water slicing through an opening in an evergreen forest. Beyond the bridge, the trail continues to climb steadily upward. Keep in mind that on any trail, especially on one that ultimately climbs almost 2,000 feet, it's always important to pace yourself. A quarter mile up the trail, there is a junction with the John Muir Trail as it goes off to the right. The Muir Trail climbs to the top of Nevada Falls via a series of long switchbacks, but it bypasses the base of Vernal Falls. Just beyond the junction with the John Muir Trail, another trail sign directs hikers down a rough side path to the large flat rocks above the riverbed for a closer overview of the falls. From this vantage point, the true scale of the 317-foot drop of Vernal Falls comes into perspective. Compared to the falls, hikers look like human miniatures as they start up the stone stair steps that ultimately lead to the hanging valley at the top of the falls. This portion of the trail is known as the Mist Trail. The low water level caused by the seasonal fluctuation in the watershed and the light wind leaves the trail dry on this crisp, clear autumn day. As the trail nears the falls, the life-giving effects of wind-blown water are evident in the lush green foliage that covers the hillside. The pace on the trail slows as hikers pause to rest. Another reason for stopping is simply to marvel at the power of the magnificent waterfall before them. As the trail passes closer to the falls, the sound of the water crashing to the rocks below rises to a deafening crescendo. The sights and sounds of this magnificent waterfall are enough to make the effort it took just to get to this point worthwhile. However, this is definitely not the time nor the place to stop. It's just seven-tenths of a mile from the bridge to the top of the falls. But this seven-tenths of a mile is one of the steepest sections on the entire length of the Vernal Falls Trail. For the novice hiker, this stair-step trail seems to just go on and on forever. Don't be discouraged. Take your time. Rest, and soon you will be at the top of the falls. The last portion of the trail to the top of Vernal Falls is marked by a narrow path across the face of a steep cliff. Without the guardrails, this would be a harrowing climb. But with them, it's as easy as climbing a somewhat irregular staircase. At last, the trail reaches the edge of the cliff at the top of the falls. From this vantage point, hikers can look past the lip of the falls to the floor of the glacier-carved canyon where the trail began, and beyond to the lofty granite wall of Glacier Point on the opposite wall of the canyon. From here, you can also look upstream past the gleaming white dome of Liberty Cap to the next destination of this hike, Nevada Falls. Another two miles one way, and an elevation gain of 1,000 feet still lies ahead to reach the top of Nevada Falls. At 594 feet, Nevada Falls is nearly twice as high as Vernal Falls. The Merced River surges across a flat section of rock on its way to the small pool at the top of Vernal Falls called Emerald Pool. The trail recrosses the Merced River via a small bridge that spans a narrow gorge. The trail never actually approaches the bottom of Nevada Falls. By the time hikers have a clear view of the falls, the trail is roughly parallel to the midway point of this powerful cascade. This section of the trail is one of the steeper portions. Hikers move up slowly as the trail follows a number of sharp switchbacks through another large boulder field. Nevada Falls is the result of the Merced River plunging over the lip of this valley into the next valley some 600 feet below. The question for our time is whether the park is as fragile as its namesake waterfall. 
ear barely marking the course of its 2,400-foot descent? Or is the park as durable as the rocky canyon walls that surround this sublime alpine valley? Can we enjoy the park without destroying the fragile mantle of forests, meadows, wildlife, and water that give it life? While there is no final solution to the man-made problems that beset this wilderness, there is no question that the spectacular beauty of the granite walls that frame the majestic sights of Yosemite Valley will last for generations to come. We must preserve the scene before us. If you enjoyed this program, hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the series.